Pastor Matt, I want to welcome you to Cross Point Church's online worship service. Thank you for joining us. We pray that the worship today will guide you into God's presence, may speak to you, challenge you, encourage you, and remind you of his power, hope, and love. Now, as you prepare yourselves to worship, I want to encourage you to ready your hearts. Find somewhere comfortable to sit where you can join us with minimal distractions. You can now take this time to silence or to turn off your phones. And I want to encourage you to have your Bible, a journal, and a pen ready to follow along the message and to take some notes. And if you have children, we encourage you to sing together and worship as a family. Now let's take a moment right now to pray and ask God to ready your mind and heart to come into his presence. Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the other side? Oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise? Against the rush of grace descending From the source of its supply Cause in the highlands and the heartache You're neither more or less inclined I would search and stop at nothing you're just not that hard to find Oh, I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you when the mountain's in my way You're the summit where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same no less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray Cause you're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands, in the heartache, all the same Oh, oh Does your kindness extend the path From where your feet rest on the sunrise To where you sweep the sinners past And oh how fast would you come running If just to shadow me through the night Trace my steps through all my failures And walk me out the other side For who could dare ascend that mountain That valley hill called Calvary But for the one I call Good Shepherd Who like a lamb was slain for me Oh, I will praise you on the mountains And I will praise you when the mountain's in my way You're the summit where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same No less God within the shadows no less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands, in the heartache, all the same Oh, oh, and sing it out Whatever I walk through, wherever I am 
sins wherever I stand And if ever I walk through the valley of death I'll sing through the shadow as my song of ascent Whatever I walk through, wherever I am Your name can move mountains wherever I stand And if ever I walk through the valley of death I'll sing through the shadows My song of ascent My song of ascent Whoa. song of a set oh, 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 oh. From the gravest of all valleys Come the pastures we call grace A mighty river flowing upwards From a deep but empty grave So I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you when the mountain's in my way You're the summit where my feet are So I will praise you in the valleys all the same no less God within the shadows No less faithful when the night leads me astray You're the heaven where my heart is In the highlands, in the heartache all the same It's running after me Your 
goodness is running after It's running after me With my life laid down I've surrendered now I give you everything Your goodness is running after It's running after me You have been faithful And all my life You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing Of the goodness of God my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able And I will sing of the goodness of God And I will sing of the goodness of God I'm so confused
Dear brothers and sisters, I'm Pastor Leung from Crosspoint Church. Welcome to worship with us online. Nearly 300 people have registered to attend yesterday's online Cantonese Bible conference. We give thanks to Pastor So for his sharing. We will also have our Mandarin and Cantonese Bible classes on the book of Malachi, and also creative teaching class taught by Reverend Chiu. Please sign up as soon as possible. Also, we have prepared another parent seminar in the month of July. Our upcoming parent seminar will be on understanding the peer and social pressures of youth today. Now, come listen to our guest speaker, Dr. Paul Kelly, who is chair of educational leadership at Gateway Seminary. He has years of experience working directly with youth and researching youth of all ages and different cultures. Come and learn how to be better understanding parents and communicate more effectively discipling our teenagers. I wish all of you well in body and soul. See you in the air next Sunday. And let me take this opportunity to wish that all of you have a happy belated, a great fourth and happy Independence Day to all of you. Now let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 to 22. Sorry, again, Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 to 22. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left the nets and followed him. Now going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat, and their father Zebedee preparing the nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and the father and followed him. Now let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for giving us your word so that we can have a clear understanding of your will to us. May God speak to us today and may this Holy Spirit guide us today so that we would be able to have a clear understanding of what type of message that you are trying to convey to each and every one of us today. And God, I ask you to, to uh, bestow, to, uh, I pray for all those that you can uh, bestow upon, all the gifts that you have bestowed upon us to speak through me so that I would be able to convey your message clearly, concisely. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> now, I'm not sure um, any one of you um, have received a phone call. I've been receiving phone calls on a daily basis. And as a matter of fact, you know, as I was looking at my phone right now, I can see that I already missed 10 calls today. And some of them I'm aware of. Some of them I don't know at all. So what determines whether I would take the call, not usually... I would look at the caller ID and I would try to see if I recognize the name or do I know this body before I would determine whether I would uh, answer the call or not. And sometimes the call would come at a time that we just don't want to be interrupted. And there are times that the phone calls would come in that we, we are in the middle of something. And there are times that we actually decide to return the call later or even send a message or simply just to ignore it because it's so annoying. And sometimes what we do is we would send a text message or leave a voicemail for apologizing for missing the call <clears throat> and then telling them that uh, our availability, when we would be available to talk. <clears throat> and quite frankly, there were times that the phone calls were coming in that were so annoying, particularly <clears throat> when we are having dinner or when we are in the middle of a work day. And in some rare cases, we may even have to block some calls because these guys keep calling and we may have to simply block them. And in the very rare cases, we might even have to change our phone number just to avoid getting these type of calls from now on, such as, for instance, such as the marketing call maybe, or sometimes even, you know, maybe your ex-boyfriend or your, your ex-girlfriend just keep calling. But regardless, what do you do? I mean, I just want to ask you, what do you usually do when you receive 
incoming calls? Would you answer the call or would you simply ignore them? Or would you take the call when you were in the middle of your workday or in the middle of something that you are working on? Would you take the call? Would you take the call or would you answer if God is calling you today? Or in other words, what would happen if God is calling you Would you answer the call or would you decline to answer the call? And also, are you going to take the call right away from God if you are in the middle of your work? Now, according to the passage that we just read, Jesus was actually calling two pairs of brothers when they were still busy working. Now, if you look at verse 20 and 22, <clears throat> Both verses tell us that these pairs of brothers were actually working and they were called by Jesus to follow them when they were still busy working in the middle of the workday. And these two brothers actually, they what did they do? They at once, according to, to the Bible, they at once and immediately left the nets. And the other pair of brothers, James and John, actually even left their father behind. And then they follow Jesus. Now, of course, <clears throat> you, may, you, you may question the meaning of follow me. What exactly does follow me mean? Now, according to the Jewish culture, to follow me means calling for discipleships. Now, in Greek, <clears throat> uh, if you take a look at Greek, follow me means take me as your master or as your teacher and then walk the same path of life that I walk. Walk the same path of life that I walk. In other words, you go after me, and that's exactly what the meaning in Greek means. And it, 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 in, in this type of discipleship, it all begins with a life, with a relationship with the master. That is, the disciples were to follow him around, live with him, and study with him. So basically, Jesus is telling these two pair of brothers, follow me, stick with me, learn from me, and become like me. So discipleship, discipleship is to follow Jesus. And following Jesus means leaving things behind. Now perhaps we may find the behavior of these two brothers very amazing because they just left everything right away. But we may find their behavior kind of bizarre or even seems ab abrupt or even reckless because they respond to a stranger immediately without procrastination or immediately without any hesitation. Now again, in verse 20, here it says, the, the first pair of brothers, Peter and Andrew, at once they left the nets and follow Jesus. Now, verse 22 says, now this is the second pair of brothers, James and John. They immediately left the boat and their father and follow Jesus. Now, if we start reading Matthew chapter 1 all the way up to here, uh, chapter 4, verse 22, when the disciples left the work and followed Jesus, it seems Jesus had never met these four people before. And it would seem rather, I mean, it seems rather unusual <clears throat> or even unreasonable that just because a rabbi, even a powerful one, said, follow me. And then someone would immediately leave the profession and the family. And it seems like the Bible used the, at once and also immediately. And if I were to use it in my own words, I would say these four brothers instantaneously left everything that they were doing and then follow Jesus. That seems very bizarre because you hardly know this person at all. Isn't that true? Well, but, the, but however, the key to understanding the behavior of these two sets of brothers is to read in the context of all the four Gospels and pay attention to the details. When we read all four Gospels, we could see that Peter, Andrew, James, and John, <clears throat> they knew Jesus. They heard about Jesus. Now, let's take a look at the Gospel of John. 
Now, the Gospel, of, the Gospel of John tells us that the first pair of brothers, Peter and Andrew, had heard about Jesus. And as a matter of fact, Andrew was actually one of the disciples of John the Baptist. If you take a look at the, uh, chapter 1 of the Gospel of John. And John probably has already told Andrew and their disciples that John the Baptist himself, he himself is a forerunner. He's not the Messiah. And he probably has already talked about Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is actually the Lamb of God. Now, remember in uh, John chapter 1, verse 35, when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. So Andrew has already knew has already heard about Jesus, and he knew who Jesus is. <clears throat> and then for the second pair of brothers, James and John. Now, the Gospel of Luke tells us that these uh, brothers were actually partners of Simon Peter. In other words, they were actually the business partners in the fishing business. And they pr probably had heard about Jesus through the fishing partners as well. And they heard about him preaching in the preceding section in in the uh, gospel in uh, verse 17. So in other words, to summarize, this was not the first encounter between them and Jesus. Again, they heard about Jesus and they all had a fundamental understanding who, of who Jesus was. And in other words, this call from Jesus was not something out of the blue for Jesus knew them beforehand and they also knew Jesus beforehand. In addition, we also have to understand that there is a sense of urgency and there's a sense of imminence when Jesus called these two pair of brothers. Now, if you could take a look at verse 17, which is in the preceding uh, passage, preceding verse, Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Now, in the Greek perfect tense, which is in the indicative mood, it means that the kingdom of heaven is near. It means that it, um, it means extreme closeness or a immediate imminence. In other words, there's a sense of urgency. <clears throat> and having sensed the urgency of the call from Jesus, these two pairs of brothers left everything immediately, including their livelihood and their family, to follow Jesus. However, was that really the case? And it's a fact that they knew that it was urgent, that's for sure. However, did they really have to leave everything behind for Jesus? Now, I would make the conjecture that a majority of our brothers and sisters would feel that based on the accounts of the calling of the first disciples, that everyone who followed Jesus has to leave every part of their life behind, such as their possessions, uh, such as their families, such as their business, their career. Is that true? Well, this is not rightfully so. As I have said before, <clears throat> Andrew was actually one of the disciples of John the Baptist. However, when Jesus called Andrew, Andrew was still making a living as a fisherman. So in other words, he did not leave his business at all. And if you could take a look, well, if you can read on to Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, you can see that the mother of uh, Zebedee's son, James and John, was actually with them. Now, let's take a look at uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. The mother of Zebedee's son, who was James and John, came to Jesus with her sons, kneeling down and asked a favor of him. What is it you want? Jesus asked. And then she said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. So in other words, these two brothers, they were with their mother and the mother was with them when they came to see Jesus. So none of these two sets of brothers actually left the jobs nor their family. And as a matter of fact, not everyone who follow Jesus is called to leave everything behind in order to follow him. And a plausible interpretation, or based on my understanding, the, the 
possible or the plausible interpretation for this is that we are all called to follow Jesus. However, we are called to make Jesus the number one priority in our life, which means that we have to leave some things behind, but not everything. And it will look different for everyone. For instance, some people will be called to leave their home and then move to a far away land or to a distant land where they will be uh, sharing the gospel to a unreached or to a um, very uh, unable to a very unable the far away people, a group of people that are considered unreachables, so that they can share the gospel with those people. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to have an opportunity to hear. And of course, this will require them to leave behind the family, their friends, and even the comfort of the North American life, so to speak. And others will be called to leave behind a job or a dream that contradicts with God's calling on their life. So in other words, everyone who follows Jesus must leave behind some of the former aspects of their life. This is all about priorities. Now, when Jesus becomes the greatest and the highest priority in your life, it reorients everything in your life. Your job, your marriage, your family, your money, your possessions, or whatever used to be first in your life has to give up its place because Jesus cannot be your great priority, cannot be on your first priority when something else has already claimed that spot. When we follow Jesus, we must be ready to leave some things behind so that they do not get to the first priority any longer. Now, as you can see from these two pairs of brothers, Jesus interrupts their daily routine activities and calls them, and they respond to Jesus instantaneously or right away because Jesus is on the top of the list. So let me ask you today, is Jesus your first priority in your life? Or are you putting Jesus first in your daily life? Is Jesus on your top of your list in your daily schedule? Now, I know that the most of us has heard about tithing, though not many of us are actually doing it, of course. And everyone certainly know what tithing is. I, I, at least I would say a majority, even if not all. And tithing is about giving your first and best 10% of your earnings to God. However, I read a book recently, and the author actually suggests, a very good suggestion, actually suggests, suggests that besides money, have we ever thought about tithing your time to God? And after all, people often say, time is money. Now, all of us are well aware that we have 24 hours a day, and 10%, let's say, tithing 10% is about 2.4 hours. But let's run it off, let's say, two hours. Have we ever thought about setting apart, let's say, two hours of your day to come near to God? If you do, I think you will find it a very rewarding experience because as we submit to God, you will be able to see amazing things happen in your life. You will find that when you choose to tithe your time with God and the rest of the day will flow much, much better than it otherwise could have. Just like when you, <clears throat> I'm sorry, just like when you tithe your money or your offering, you will find that your money will multiply and this is what is promised, or what God had promised in the book of Malachi. And I can be a living testimony of that. And because prior to becoming a pastor, uh, I was working in sales. And I have been, I, I'm not bragging, okay? But I have to uh, honestly acknowledge the fact that I've, I have been consistently and consecutively exceeding and meeting quotas. And it's not because of the fact that I'm good at sales. It's all because of the fact that uh, I have a good wife because my wife has been doing faithful tithing and she has been offering 10% and sometimes even more than 10% of my earnings to God. So when that happens, my money multiplies, my sales multiply. So lots of my colleagues 
have asked me, how could you consecutively and consistently, not just meeting quota, but exceeding of your sales quotas? And I told them, just do your offering. And of course, they wouldn't believe it. But however, I can assure you that I, I have a living testimony. I have, I have proven that to be true. When you give God your first fruits, He will bless and sanctify all the rest. And I can assure you that when you tithe 10% of your, of your day, it won't be squandered. And in fact, I have found out that the remaining 90% of your day turn out to be more fruitful and more efficient than what you have thought. So, brothers and sisters, try it out, test it out, and see what happens. Type your time, and you will see great results that will come out of it when you put Jesus first or when you put Jesus on the top of your list, on your daily schedule. <clears throat> so nevertheless, besides putting Jesus first as your first priority, following Jesus means fishing for people. Now, Christ's first instructions to his new follower was, come follow me. And then his second instruction was, I will send you out to fish for people. Now, what does that mean? Now, the meaning is twofold. First and foremost, Jesus was using a play of words, a play on words, when he told their occupation as fishermen and then turned it around, saying that he would send them out to fish for people. Now, remember, turn around. Just turn around from fishermen. Instead of fishing, for, instead of uh, catching fish, from now on, you're going to catch people. And in fact, Jesus was actually calling them to repent. Now, why did they say that? Again, in the preceding section on verse 17, Jesus was preaching and saying that repent for the kingdom of, uh, the, for the kingdom of God, God is near. And repent in Greek means to turn around, literally, turn around. So Jesus was now calling these fishermen to turn around and head into a new directions to catch people as opposed to catch fish. Now, second, we need to have a clear understanding of the fishing method, method of these four fishermen. Now, these first century fishermen did not use any fishing rod to catch the fish. They used a net to catch the fish. What they do is basically they threw out a circular um, casting net and it was then drawn back to the boat to catch any fish swimming by as it was taking up to the boat again. And this is going to be a repetitive process. They're going to, because they're not using any bait. So what they do is they throw the net out and then put it back to the boat, hoping to catch any fish. And this is going to be a very tedious, time consuming, and this is going to be a repetitive process because, is, because there may be times that they would not be able to catch a single fish. So they have to do this over and over again. And in addition, a fisherman cannot see the fish. So fishing is actually an act of faith. If they cast out the net and then pull, pull back the empty, uh, I mean, pull, put it back with an empty hand, then they have to do it over and over again. As I said before, they have to do it several times to cast the net several times a day and hopefully expecting to get something out of it. However, there is no guarantee. No guarantee. Now remember what Jesus, I'm sorry, remember what Peter said to Jesus in Luke chapter 5. Peter said to Jesus, Master, we have worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Haven't caught anything. Now remember, Peter is a professional fisherman. And she, he has been a fisherman for, for some time. But he, Again, fishing is an act of faith. He couldn't catch anything, even a professional fisherman like him. But Jesus told Peter to put out into the deep water <clears throat> and let down the nets for a catch. Now, did you remember what happened? Now, the Bible says in uh, Luke 5, they caught such a large number of fish that the nets began to break. So Peter had to ask their partners, James and John, to help. And both of the boats were so full of fish that the boats began to sink. And the same thing to fish for people is a work of faith. 
We simply cannot tell whether a soul will be brought to Jesus when we cast out our nets, our gospel nets. For instance, I cannot tell whether my sermon today will be receptive to the person who have been listening today. However, I do believe that Jesus will guide me through in the casting of the gospel net at the pulpit. I have complete confidence and I have complete dependence on him and I expect him to take the lead. And so was Peter. He was completely dependent on the Holy Spirit to tell him when he should cast a net to catch people. If you take a look at the book of Acts, in chapter 2, verse 41, when Peter cast his net for the first time, he caught how many fish? 3,000 people. Oh, 3,000 fish, you can say that. And when he cast his net for the second time in the book of Acts, in chapter 4, verse 4, he caught 5,000 people or 5,000 fish. Now let's all learn from Peter and ask the Holy Spirit to empower us so that we would be able to boldly cast our net and fish for people. Now besides relying on the power of the Holy Spirit, I think a fisherman also has to do his part too. What do I mean by that? The fisherman needs to have a good understanding of the hit fish habits and also its habitat so that they know when and where to cast the nets. Now, during the biblical times, it is a well-known fact that the Sea of Galilee, um, that when you catch fish, you do it at night and you do it in shallow water, not in daytime and not in deep water. But however, you have to study that. And fishing was usually the best during the nighttime when the fish were still active and much, much closer to the surface. So it is easier to catch them. Now, I remember that I had an opportunity to visit the Holy Land. I had an opportunity to go to the Sea of Galilee way back in 2014. And I was informed that by the local people that in the old days that the fishermen has to go out and fish for seven to ten uh, seven to eight times during the night or by the early morning in order to catch or in order to bring in a half a ton of fish. So in other words, what I'm trying to say, in other words, I'm trying to say this without a good understanding of the nature of the fish, the habits of the fish, the habitat of the fish, the fishermen simply wouldn't be able to know when and where to cast a net and they wouldn't be able to catch a single fish without studying the nature and the habitat of the fish. Similarly, in order to fish for people, these two pairs of brothers, from now on, they can use the same set of the skills, but they need to have a good understanding of people. They need to be sensitive to the, sensitive to the needs of the people. They need to understand the concerns of different types of people so that they can look for opportunities to cast the nets, so to speak, when and where to cast the gospel nets on them. And they all needed to learn all these skills from their master, from Jesus, from, from their rabbi. Now, Jesus is the great fisherman, and he showed his disciples how to cast the gospel net at the right place and at the right time. Now, let me give you some examples. Remember, <clears throat> Jesus went to Sychar to cast the gospel net to the Samaritan woman at the well. Now he understands her spiritual needs and tell her that I'm the living water and the Samaritan woman was caught. Now on another occasion, Jesus tells the woman who was caught in adultery to leave her sin, leave her life of sin, I'm sorry, and tells her that, tells her and the people that Jesus, he himself is the light of the world and he forgave her sins. And he also said, whoever follows him will never walk into the darkness of sins. Now the Bible, of course, didn't tell what happened to this woman after Jesus forgave her sins. But I am fairly certain that this woman was caught. Now, Jesus teaches that we need to put ourselves into their shoes 
in order to understand what the most needs are so that we would be able to fish for people. We need to put ourselves into their shoes. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 20 to 23, Paul said to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things, all people, so that by all possible means, I may save some. I do this for the sake of gospel, that I may share in its blessings. No. <clears throat> Are we all willing to learn from the Apostle Paul and spend time to study and understand the different backgrounds of people, the different cultures of people, the different needs of all those people of fish that God has bestowed upon your life. Are we willing to spend time to do that? Now, finally, I'm not sure if you heard about the light of the world. Now, this painting is it's actually done or created by William Holman Hunt. And he spent nine years for completing this beautiful, magnificent painting. And I think it's probably more famous than any of the works of the great masters of the Renaissance. It is now hanging at St. Paul's Cathedral at London. And every year, thousands of people flock to see what was known as the Sermon of the Frame. And actually, this painting was illustrating Revelation, <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will enter his house and dine with him and he with me. Now, if you look closely at a painting, you can see that <clears throat> Jesus, on one hand, is holding a lantern. And Jesus is raising another hand to knock at a closed door. And the door itself, you can see that has been overgrown with brambles and ivy. And also the door's hinges are actually rusty, which means that it looks like the door has never been opened before. In addition, the door, if you look closely again, the door actually has no handle on the outside, which means that it has to be opened from the inside. So based on these observations, what is, what is the painter trying to tell us? Now, I believe the closed door represents our human hearts. And the door can only be open if we open our hearts to Jesus. And Jesus is not going to do a forced entry for sure. sure. But Jesus, as you can see, he is standing outside and knocking. However, is anyone listening? Will someone respond to Jesus knocking and open the door for Jesus? Now, Christ is knocking, and he's hoping for a response. But if you, again, look closely at the painting, Christ's facial expression is pensive, and he's expectant. Now, let me ask you, uh, brothers and sisters, have you heard the knocking from Jesus? Or have you heard the calling from Jesus. Now, Christ has been calling. Will you answer or will you decline to answer? Christ may be calling you today, perhaps at an unexpected hour or maybe in the middle of your work day, but Christ is calling you today and Christ is calling you now. Will you answer? Now, let me close with Luke Chapter 9, verse 57. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. I will follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. I will follow Jesus wherever 
Jesus go. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving us your message. Thank you for calling us to be your disciples. It's a privilege. And it's also a noble task that we would be able to accept or to answer your call to become your disciples. Let's answer your call today because you have been calling, you have been knocking on the door. We have to open the door and we have to take your call regardless of our circumstances, regardless of what we have been doing. May God give us the courage. May God give us the boldness to go wherever you go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I could just sit, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence. I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you, hope to feel something again. to who I am and never let you change me from the inside and I can be safe oh I could be safe here in your arms and never leave home never let these walls down but you have called me higher you have called me deeper and I'll go where you will You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you will lead me, Lord, where you lead me. I can hold on, I can hold on to who I am and never let change me from the inside and I can be safe oh I could be safe here in your arms and never leave home never let these walls down but you have called me higher you have called me deeper and I'll go where you will lead me Lord you have called me higher you have called me deeper and I'll go where you will lead me, Lord, where you lead me. You lead me, Lord. I will be yours, oh, I will be yours for all my life.
Thank you for worshiping with us today. I hope you enjoyed our time and I hope you enjoyed the message. If you have any questions about anything that you've heard today regarding the sermon, I want to encourage you to join us for a time of Q&A at 1045 a.m. You can contact me below uh, for more details. I hope to see you there.